but we have a lot we have a lot to do. So look, I'm going to introduce uh, the two panelists. Thank you very much. And we are going to go right into a discussion with two pretty extraordinary experts on this topic. We're going to talk a little bit about policymakers' role in this. And then at some point, Ed Markey is going to show up and say whatever Ed Markey wants to say about privacy, <laughs> because he's been a very good leader on this topic for a long time. So uh, let, me, let me introduce two. On your far right, my left, is Julie Brill, the Federal Trade Commissioner, who quite simply has been one of the leading advocates for privacy for everybody in this country, and particularly for kids and teens for a while. She is, I will say, I'm allowed to say this, she is the star of the Federal Trade Commission right now. <laughs> and we are delighted that Julie is here. She used to do this in uh, Vermont, North Carolina before she came to Washington. So she has been a stalwart leader along with former Chairman Leibowitz, who was up here a few minutes ago, as you saw. Um, and so we're delighted to have Julie Hill. Ju Julie here. And on my left, your right, is Jim Shelton, um, who's been one of the key players in this country over the past five to 10 years on the entire development of innovation and technology and education. And I first met Jim when he was at the Gates Foundation, where he was an important leader. He's an ex-McKinsey guy. We'll forgive him for that. And, um, then, uh, and then Jim, as you all know, became Assistant Secretary of Education for Innovation under Arnie when Arnie first came to be Secretary of Education. And he's now the, is it acting or? Acting. Acting Deputy Secretary of Education. And I will tell you this, in all the work that we have done at the LEAD Commission and also at Common Sense on education technology in this country, the person who day to day is the leader, visionary, and stalwart on all this in Department of Ed, and I know Arnie would say that if it's here, it's Jim Shelton. So we have two major players here. And let me start out, and, and I'm gonna definitely leave time for you guys, because we were, before, Julie, you were here, but Jim, you were not. We had Joel Klein, and we had from McGraw-Hill, yeah, right? And then, is Cameron still here? He's coming back from Microsoft. These guys want some guidance about you know, what's gonna happen from a regulation standpoint. We had Terry Greer and other education leaders here, so it's been really interesting. But Julie, I wanna start with a question for you. Because I was listening to comments that in the last panel before Arnie spoke. And you know, you've really focused on consumer privacy, right? There's a big, and now one of the big issues coming up today is what's the issue? When does consumer privacy and, and student privacy begin? So I just want you to talk about that for a little. So, because you, you know what I mean? I was listening to the conversation. What do we think about if we're really putting students first? Where does that consumer role, or should they be blended together and have a much tougher regimen for consumer privacy as well as student privacy? Well, those are some pretty big questions, yeah. Jim. So take a so, shot at it. So let me just, first of all, thank Common Sense Media, you, Jim, and Joni, and the whole team for uh, putting on this conference, for inviting me. Um, we uh, at the Federal Trade Commission uh, are the enforcers, and um, we wrote the regulation behind the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So we have a real role to play when it comes to children's privacy, particularly under 13. But I think your question, and what's so interesting here is, here's the way I'd like to approach your question, sure. okay? What is it that we can learn from what's been happening in the commercial space? Yep and some of the lessons we can learn there and bring them to the student and children's space. And from my perspective, there are some real lessons uh, there. And I think one thing we know for sure is figuring out privacy is hard. It's hard for parents, and I think it's gonna be hard for schools. From my perspective, we definitely could use rules, legislation, best practices, but I would really like to see those players who know the most about data collection and practices, step up to the plate and really engage the schools, engage parents, and be upfront and transparent about their data collection and use. And who is that? Yeah. That's industry. In my view, they are where the buck should be stopping because they are where the information is being collected and where information may, may flow. Now, having said that, I wanna be real clear. There's an, a very important role for schools there's a very important role for parents. Everybody has an important role to play. But I think what we've learned in the commercial space, what I believe to be fundamentally true, 
is in the commercial space, we need a lot more transparency about data collection and use. And I have various proposals. I've spoken about this a ton of, ton of times. I think what we need to see in the kids' space is not a replication of what's been happening in the commercial space. We need to see, in some ways, we could look at all the great potential for um, uh, use of information for educating kids, all the wonderful things that we've heard about today, which I am a firm believer in. We could say, let's use the kids' privacy zone as a way to transform all data collection and use in this country, making it much more transparent and giving parents and consumers much better tools. So I I'll start off that way. I think it's a great start, but I want to, Jim, can I ask a follow up to Julian? Yeah, sure, go. Okay, so, you know, we were very, uh, candidly, we're very involved in the recent legislation in California. And what we tried to do was sort of, and by the way, as I said in my opening, I wouldn't call them remarks, but comment, was, hey, we can amend the legislation, but it isn't great. We can fix it. We put it out there because we thought it was really important to put it out there and start to say, these are the, we took those three principles, which I was glad to hear Arnie basically re reaffirm, and then we tried to put it in some kind of legislative form in the state of California where the single largest number of kids go to school in this country. And we're, our point was industry focused, not school focused. That doesn't mean that schools don't have a huge role. Exactly. But our point was start with industry. They actually know the most. So if you were designing, not that you are, legislation, then Jim, I'm going to do a follow up with you on this. Would you, is that where you would go? Because that's what you're trying to do in California. And as I said, it's just draft legislation right now, but it has been introduced. We hope it will pass in so, final, at some final point. So I, I mean, we already have legislation that focuses on schools, right? We have FERPA, we've got COPPA, which to a certain extent right. also put, pays to some responsibility on schools. I guess what I would like to see, again, whether it's legislation or whether it's industry just stepping up to the plate and instituting best practices, which I think they can do right now. Right. Before we enact legislation, I do think that there are some real key steps that industry can, can, can engage in, especially in the space where you're talking about use of kids' data for educational purposes. So, Jim, follow up. So you guys are going to make, because Arnie just said, you know, there's going to be an announcement about FERPA tomorrow or, or new guidance on this stuff. I have a big question for you, which is, you know this field really well and have been a pioneer in building a lot of this stuff out. How much of this do you think is going to happen? At, how much, what's the role of the federal government versus, to this issue yep, yep. versus it's either state and local efforts and, and industry self-regulation? So how much do you think you guys can really do versus sure. what states should do and, and the industry should do? So let me start by doing two things. One is clarifying that um, I am not the expert. The expert over there is Kathleen Stiles, right. who's the chief privacy officer. She's shaking her head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kathleen, you just want to come up and join us? Up there? <laughs> <laughs> so when you uh, see the guidance that's going to come out, you, you will know who actually um, crafted it. The, um, the, the second thing I want to do, though, is to start by reemphasizing the point that Julie made, which is that the very first step in this actually ought to be industry taking care of itself. And yeah. there's always questions about, is industry capable of policing itself? Um, what I have been saying for years, recognizing that I've cut across working in Correct. industry and things like that, is that we've seen this movie before. And so if industry does not figure out how to um, take positive steps very early on, then what will happen is something bad is going to happen. We've, we've already seen it. Luckily, so far, nothing bad has happened, really bad has happened. Something bad is going to happen, and the reaction speed will be like that. Yeah. And there will not be thoughtful conversation. There will not be really good vetting of what are the long-term implications of this new policy or legislation, whether it's federal or state. It's going to come down hard and heavy, and there's going to be a lot of collateral damage. That's just what's going to happen. We've seen it in lots of different sectors already. So it is, in, it is in industry's best interest, forget about being the right thing to do, it is industry's best interest, right. and frankly, in the interest of somebody who cares about the potential that learning technologies and data have for student learning and for parent engagement and for all kinds of things, um, it is imperative that industry take steps forward now before something happens. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, it's fine. The second thing I want to say is I, I do think that there is an important role for the federal government to play. The good news is that the federal government is in here with FERPA and COPPA and things like yep. that. Um, but one of the things, I, uh, when I look at this stuff, I look at it uh, in a lot of different ways. But one of the ways I look at it is from the perspective of what allows for innovation to happen. And for, 
providers, and now, you know, any provider in here can object to me at one time, at any point in time, figuring out how to maneuver different scenarios of what this looks like in every different state is problematic. So being able to have a, a kind of a view across the country about how this is going to play out, what the rules of the road are, how you actually, um, uh, actually need to execute against the law, having that guidance at, from a national view, from a federal view, is actually really helpful. That said, every state is going to figure out what they actually need to feel comfortable that their citizens and their children in particular are protected. And so I know that there are going to be movements. There already are movements. The California is only one of many examples right. where the states are, are moving on this. I think that it is, it is not a question of whether or not the state should do it or the feds should do it. I think the reality is both are going to do it. And the question is, can we do it in a way that it's actually complementary? where we learn from each other about what actually the practice looks like on the policy side. Because yeah. um, I, I, I am as worried, I am, I am worried about uh, uh, protecting the privacy of students. I'm also worried about us um, missing the opportunity to, missing the opportunity to use this data effectively um, for the benefit of students. And we could just as easily do that if we, over, if we overreach. Right. So I think we're going to see states play out, and I'm hoping that we can inform those conversations very quickly so that, um, so that we don't wind up with unintended consequences. So let me ask you guys a follow-up question about the industry self-regulation space, because when John was here, Julie, you heard John, right? Mm -hmm. So And Jim, it was, he, he said classic John Lee Butch. He said, you know, we're not worried about whatever it was, the best case, the best actors, right? Which I agree with. And, and, and you know, we had the best actor. We had Joel and... You know, Catherine and, and then and, and Cameron here. We're worried about the bad actors. Yep. So my question to you is, in a world, I, I agree with you about, we've seen this movie before too, Jim. So my question to you is, in a world of industry self-regulation, how do you deal with the bad actors? Including, by the way, not just the small little, little app guy who might or might not go away. But there's some big companies that are bad actors too. Let's not kid ourselves. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to deal with that in a world where there's only industry self-regulation? The bad actors, not the good actors. How do you think? How do you think you deal with that? So I want to push back on the premise because I think okay. that the reality is that we already have a world of both. Yeah, right? I agree. We have a world of both. We have a federal policy framework. Many states have a framework that is not going anywhere. And in fact, what you see from us is we are trying to evolve it as quickly as possible to respond to the changing world. That's not going to change. And I think that we will hear from uh, one representative yeah. today who has a very clear view about the need to actually insert something else into the, into the uh, ecosystem to make sure that we're actually um, able to deal with the issues as they arise. Uh, so I don't think it's an either or yep. scenario. I think it is an and both scenario. And, um, and what we have to do is to make sure that we create mechanisms that allow us to actually deal with the bad actors. Um, and, and that is going to be the question. Julie, what do you think? So, um, so first of all, I also agree that we have baseline rules. So we're already in a in a in a mixed um, a co regulatory system, as some people like to call it. Um, my experience, having done uh, written rules, helped draft laws, dealing with enforcement work for over uh, twenty five years, is it's almost impossible to write something that's just focused on quote unquote bad actors. And I actually, when you know, what you do is you focus on good practices, bad practices. Right. You can't really focus on good people, bad people. Right. And my enforcement philosophy is it's kind of like I say to my kids, my now late teenagers, <laughs> I say, you know, it's not that you're a good person or a bad person, you just make bad choices. And you can correct those choices by doing something different. And I think the same is true with companies. I mean, you can't really say there's like this world of good companies right. and this world of bad companies. Everybody has problems at some level or another. So I think um, the trick is to, and, and, and I want to go back to something that Jim said, because I completely agree with you, the point that you made, which is not only is what, I'm, what we're talking about the right thing to do, developing best practices even before legislation were to get enacted or rules were to get written, but also it really is in, I believe, industry's best interest because this use of data, and one of the things that I think we've learned from all the Snowden conversations and the NSA conversations, is people are worried about free-floating data. They're worried yeah. about what's happening. Not so much with actors that they know, what I call first-party actors, but the third-party actors that are behind the scenes that may be scarfing up information, whether it's on social media or leaky apps or some other mechanism. 
ad networks, others, whatever it is, and creating profiles and doing things with that information. I think people are getting really worried about that. So for industry to, to thrive, for the kinds of benefits that we want kids to have and schools to have, I think we're going to need to see industry start to address these issues because that's going to be the kind of trusted environment, not only in the consumer context, but in the school context, that I think will really let this thrive. So let me go, you know, Jim, go ahead. Go well, ahead. I just want to add, I, say, I think that, that to this point that we have a unique opportunity, as was said, in the school space. Um, yeah. One, um, we should be having very, very informed purchasers, right? So uh, unlike the consumer space, we can actually make sure that the folks who are making these decisions know how to make good decisions. Correct. The second is that we do have a regulatory environment that is different. Um, and the way we interpret the, that regulatory environment and the rights and rules that we adhere to, both as folks who are making regulations and those folks who are adopting them, um, we can actually make a decision to actually hold tight to them. The, the, the third thing is that we can actually be the place where kids learn how to operate safely. Um, and that's something that... How do you say, how do you mean, what do you mean by that? What I mean is that just like schools and school systems are learning what are the rights that we need to protect for young people, what is the information that you need to be protecting about yourself, how do you actually get online uh, and, and do it in a way that's actually safe, what do you disclose, what don't you disclose, and to whom. By doing that and teaching that actually in a school environment where there are a certain amount of protections in place, we actually prepare young people, and can prepare young people, to be better consumers and users of technology and protectors of their own privacy when they go out into the open, open world. I think, it's a great, I think that's a great point. Julie, what do you? Well, I worry. So I agree. I, I think that's very idealistic. I'd love, I think we should strive for it. But uh, for those of you who saw Julia Angwin's piece in the Wall Street Journal on Saturday about what a, what a parent, what she does as a parent to educate her, especially she focused on her older daughter. Yeah. I mean, for those of you who don't know Julia Angwin, I mean, she is a, a highly technically adept person, I guess is the best way to right. put it, as well as um, she's now with ProPublica, but for a while she was with the Wall Street Journal okay. working on their What They Know series and really has dived right. very deeply into commercial practices. I mean, I, I could barely figure out what she was talking about, and I've been in this space for a long time. So I worry about placing too much of a burden on parents and kids. Yeah. I think we need to educate them. We absolutely need to do it, but I worry about how well we can get there. The other thing I worry, I, I just want to say, is I do agree that we can get school systems and state educational boards. Um, they may have the capability to figure this out. But I live in a very rural area yeah. in Vermont. And the school board is tiny, you know, and there's all this local, great desire to have local control. And I worry about how technically adept small rural areas can be. So I think there's going to be a great disparity yeah. in the school systems in terms of technological prowess. And we need to deal with that. So a couple of thoughts and then I want a question. So one is, you know, Jim, this is an area where national leadership, federal leadership can actually matter. It's something that we were talking with Joel Reidenberg about. about and, and, and honestly, as running common sense, you think, boy, there's something we could potentially do here. Mm -hmm. Because it's not necessarily Terry Greer in the Houston School District or Carmen Farina in New York who needs this, but it is all those smaller districts and who don't have the resources or expertise to do it. And, and couldn't we come up with some stuff? So obviously that's one of the things that's come out of the summit today that seems like a no-brainer. I want to ask you about COPPA. Because, you know, you, Julie, Joni Lupovitz, John Leibovitz, Leib Leibovitz, I wish he was here to hear me he mispronounce the name. But you guys deserve unbelievable credit from the kids and families around this country that I don't think people, in terms of, you rewrote the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which has enormous implications for every child under the age of 13 in this country. Right. Massive rewrite, right. and you actually stood up to a lot of bogus stuff from the industry, trying to get you to water everything down, et cetera. Excuse my, uh, my editorial comment. But um, I make them from time to time. But here's the deal. What does COPPA do now in the classroom? This is actually very important because, and also then, and then this follow-up will be, what do you do with the kids who are 13 and older? Right. And Which is a big issue because I have three teenagers and your kids are getting <laughs> older too, Mr. Shelton. Getting close. Get, I know. So, then, Matt, so first of all, right. what does COPPA do in schools and how relevant is it 
Right. Because it's a huge deal here. Everybody keeps going to COPPA, but so what's the, what do you think COPPA does in the school privacy context? So what COPPA does is, or is supposed to do, first of all, the most important thing to say about it is it only applies to kids under 13, as you said. So we're not talking about, typically speaking, high schools or older teens. We're or even seventh or eighth graders a lot of times. Right, right. We're talking about grammar school, basically. And it depends on how it's broken up. But um, So what it says is that, uh, and, and most relevantly in this space, that school, I mean, I mean I'm going to, um, there are some FTC lawyers here who actually deserve a lot of credit Correct. for having re helped rewrite the copper rules. So John called a, uh, one or two of them okay. out in his remarks. Okay, okay. Yeah. I missed that part. But so they're the ones who deserve a tremendous amount of credit, as our fabulous staff does on everything that we do. Um, so I'm going to, they might cringe while I say this, but basically <laughs> what COPPA does is it gives schools the ability to, uh, to um, consent to the use of kids' data, but only if it is used for um, the purposes of the school, for, for furthering educational purposes, and not if, it's, if that data is going to be used for commercial purposes. So they're the parent in the school? But only, but school. only I mean, the school is when the it's used for Education. educational purposes and not for commercial purposes. Now, um, so we have FAQs that talk about that. You know, this is a space that's obviously evolving greatly. Correct. And one of the things, again, what some of the lessons that we've learned in the commercial space, which we might want to think about as we move to the educational space, is you know, monetization of these wonderful programs and apps is a big concern by the entities that are developing them. So either the, you know, someone's going to have to pay for their, the tools they're creating. If the school systems are paying for it, great. If parents are paying for it, well, that's a different story, which we can talk about separately. But if it's getting paid for through commercialization, through advertising, that's where I think everybody needs to pay a lot of attention. That's where COPPA would kick in, and that's where I think we could end up having some problems. But monetization for companies that are doing this development is their, one of their biggest concerns. So that's where, that's where we need to have some really, we really need to be thinking about this, especially outside the COPPA context when we're talking about kids that are older. Jim, how do you see COPPA interplay? I know you're not. I know Kathleen should be up here. No, no, it's all good. Uh, well, she should be, but that's okay. Um. <laughs> it doesn't look like she wants to be. But how does the interplay between, <laughs> I mean, this is important, though, is how does, the, what's the interplay between yeah, no. COPPA and the school? So, I mean, the, the, this comes back actually to the point I was just making, which is the good news that we have right now is that we have a range of tools already at our disposal. Right. We have FERPA, we have COPPA, we have the laws that are actually being enacted in different states. And each one of them provides a layer of protection that we need to continue to evolve as the, frankly, the opportunities and the threats um, make, manifest themselves. But um, what I what I like about COPPA in particular, as a part of that, uh, as part of that is that in the part that um, is harder harder for schools to control. So, for example, um, kids have tablets in some schools, and they go home and they use tablets right. to do certain things. COPPA extends that right. lo cloak of protection when they go, go home. Absolutely. And um, we need to figure out how that interface works more, get yeah. clear about what the interface is between school and home and all that good stuff. Um, so I think that COPPA will continue to play an important role as we try and use, frankly, technology to extend the school to home right. and get better at capturing, frankly, the opportunity of kids are learning in lots of different places in lots of different ways right now. One of the things that is a missed opportunity is the school does not benefit from knowing that they're doing those things either. So at some point, we're going to have to just figure out how these things work together, both to improve the educational opportunity and to make sure that we have the right cloak of protection, both in school and at home. And how do you guys, that, that's a very, I agree, this is a really interesting frontier. And today's summit has really brought that stuff out. You can see that. My question is, that sort of a follow-up to though is, so how are we going to deal with the kids who are 13 to 17? Because I have two of them now, used to have three. Okay, what are we doing with those kids? What are we doing or what should we do? What should we do? We should enact baseline privacy legislation. We should have data broker legislation. We should have data security legislation. Period. Done. <laughs> All right, and and short it, of that, short of that, there are then proposals on eraser buttons. You know, that's yes, a, I believe we're familiar with that. Right? I, I believe you are familiar with that. And um, actually, that was a piece of the, face, the settlement that we did with Facebook. Um, as some people may know or may not know. I think giving kids tools, again, whether they're industry um, offer, you know, offered up as best practices or whether they're required by legislation, giving kids some tools so that they 
you know, once they hit maturity, once they realize, oh gosh, you know, I never should have po posted that picture, you know, way back when I was 16 or 14 or 12, and, and giving them the opportunity to sort of correct with more mature eyes, I think is a very important tool that we can give kids. Jim, what do you think on that, on the 13 to 17 year old? Uh, I know that's not, yeah. No, 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 I mean, I, I am, I, I think that the, I continue to think that recognizing the legislative piece and the regulatory framework is really important. I continue to be optimistic and think that part of what has to happen is young people have to know what is it that they are giving up. Yeah. Um, every time, you, we will not be able to regulate away buttons popping up on their screen totally. at different points in time in places where we don't anticipate them being at any given moment in time. The only way that we're going to be able to help them in those situations is we help them to make better decisions about what to say yes to and what to say no to. So I do think that the regulatory framework is really, really important, but I don't want to be dismissive at all about what we have to do, should take on, in terms of educating young people to be able to be good users of technology. Um, it's an important part of the conversation. I know it's not the focus of what you want to talk about today, but it is an important part of the overall. No, no, I think it is part of the focus, Jim. I actually think it is part of the focus. I mean, a couple of things. One, I can't remember if it was you or Julie, but look, w one of the things we see from the West, the vantage point of the West Coast, and also as a parent is, whatever you think of them, the Snowden controversy forced a lot of young people to understand a lot of stuff they didn't understand before. That was the first time my son came to me and said, Dad, now I see why you're always making all that noise about privacy stuff. No, I mean, no. And I think there are millions and millions of young people who saw what happened with the NSA and Snowden. And then I love the industry coming out and being the standard bearers for defending you against the government's intrusion of your data. But anyway, sorry, one more editorial comment. But, um, but, but no, I think it's what a critical point. My question would be is, take that, Jim, because you're a very important player on this nationally. Okay, what should we do doing with kids to educate them about this? That's not a regulatory. What do you think that, not just necessarily at the federal level, but you know, what should school districts at the state and local level, this is another area, by the way, where industry could be an extremely valuable partner if they chose to be. What do you think that we should be doing in terms of educating young people, other than occasionally having an Edward Snowden type controversy? So, I mean, uh, I think that there are, you know, kind of, there's a lot of education out there now around digital citizenship. <clears throat> Yeah. We, what we have to do is, one, make it not perfunctory and rote. Um, the reality is that this is, uh, the, that young people know that they live in this world, they know it's ever changing. Most of the time when they're engaged in it, it's actually exciting. Um, no kid that I know of, especially the ones that are 13 to 17 year olds, spends much time reading warning labels. Um, uh, they, they, are, they are prone to not think that they have to worry about those things. And so in the education process, we have to find a way to actually contextualize it for them yep. so that they can see how it actually plays out for them even when it's not about Snowden. Um, my, my son is 11 now. He's actually taking a course right now where they, where, where they literally had to um, play out the scenario of what, what happens when you give up this right, follow the data. Um, and it was intriguing for them to, to, wow. to be able to do that. And then to look at little examples online of people who had made decisions and how it played out. Yeah. Right. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, mostly unfortunately, there are plenty of examples to find right now, people who've made, made bad right, decisions right. about this stuff. And it doesn't take long for young people to be able to look at that, kind of like the drunk driving ads back in the day, and to go, oh, uh, yeah, I don't really want that to be me. Um, so I don't have a really sophisticated answer That's about what the education answer. process needs to look like. What I do know is standard protocol, especially in this context, is not going to get it. We've got to do something a little bit different than that. You want anything, Julie? Because I'm going to go to the audience, the, uh, Keith over there. Any, any fun, anything to add? Oh, well, the only, the only thing I would add to that is, you know, once schools start requiring kids to do coding, which I think they will, just like we used to write book reports on that age. Um, you know, my, my kids and my grandkids will be required to code and they'll be required to program. And I think as the younger generations just, their minds will completely shift in terms of what learning is and what they need to be focused on. I think a privacy could be a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, following data, seeing all the players that are on different apps and whatnot. I think that'll be a great um, asset for kids to be focused on. That's, those are very interesting comments. Keith. Keith Kruger with COSIN. We're the Association of Chief Technology Officers. We're absolutely committed to helping school districts understand what they have to do. And um, you heard earlier today that we're partnering with Berkman to create a toolkit 
that we'll be releasing in March. Uh, but as we were doing convenings up at Harvard, we were thinking about what, is, what are some of the inflection points that might move things. And certainly, we have to get school leaders better understanding what they have to do. Certainly, voluntarily, we have to get industry doing things. But an awful lot of the challenge today are these apps that individual students or teachers are downloading. Right. And it seems to me most of those go through stores. And so I wonder, could the federal government do a convening of industry, app providers and store. Well, you know, there's only a couple stores that really matter. There's only a couple of stores that matter. There's We know. We know them All the rest on of the one hand. Really so could the could the government convene a meeting and um, start a conversation because honestly this shouldn't be figured out by every single school district. It shouldn't be figured out by every single provider. But if they want to be in a store for education, they ought to meet at meet and adhere to certain standards. Jim and uh, Julie, what do you think of Keith's point? Well, and Jim, it's probably you who would have to do the convening, by the way. Well, <laughs> no, well we, we, or not. We, we have done a lot of work around apps, and we've done a lot of studies of apps. And so it hasn't really been focused on just on the educational space. But we did two reports on um, what apps were doing with data. And they, found, they were, and I recommend them to everybody. And that's one of the um, tools in our toolbox as we do a lot of research and reports. We found that 20% of kids' apps didn't have a privacy policy. We found that tons of apps, I forget the exact percentage, were um, leaking um, all sorts of data to third parties, including things like UDIDs and other um, uh, elements that would allow for tracking the kids across the web. So we tried to, we have been working hard at the FTC to bring sunshine and sunlight to this issue, which we think is a very important first step. Um, the other thing that we do is we spend a lot of time we, um, talking to the app community. We've written guidances for the app community, not again focus on education per se, but focus on privacy more broadly. Could we do something that's just in the education space, maybe partnering with well, the yeah. Department of Ed Education or something? I think we would probably be very open to something like that. Let me, let, let me just follow up on that, because Jim, look, we know the history of the lead commission. It was when the yep. Department of Ed, and it really was, and Arnie has been, an, and you have been unbelievable, got together with Julius yep. and Zach and a few other people, and that's what led to the whole, that whole movement. So why not something between the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Ed? to focus on this together. I think it actually sounds like a, a great idea. It's interesting, right, right? You say there's only a couple that matter. There's one- A couple who, of stores that matter. Oh, I know, a couple We of know who they are. There's one that probably does not make that list that has actually moved in this direction, right? Where they are actually starting to try and figure out how to create a safe space where that is parent trusted, right? And it, that includes certain things. I don't even know what all their rules are. Who are you are, thinking of? But it, I guess I can say it. It's, a, yeah. it's Amazon. But, but, so I don't know what their rules are. Don't know what their rules are. My guess is that without much nudging, because parents are so sensitive to any kind of signal about what actually is approved or not approved by people who matter, which is why you are so successful, um, the market would move in this direction really quickly. Yeah. And, if, and this is one where good housekeeping seals of approval yeah. matter a lot. Um, not to everybody, but to so many people my guess is that you would see pretty quick evolution. So if well, you, it's a great idea. And um, I'd love to figure out how to jump on it. Well, well Jim, to that point, I said earlier, so uh, you missed uh, Terry Porterfield here, who's a Cisco engineer who was, we met first as a parent who, who got into this field. But we're gonna, I think we're going to develop at Common Sense some version of this <laughs> from a privacy standpoint as part of our overall graphite ratings. Because it's not that we can figure that out. I mean, and, and then try to make it sort of a, if, if not a perfect standard, at least a mass standard that, by the way, that a, both a consumer and a teacher could look for. So I do think, but, but I think one of the things interesting to explore would be how could the Department of Ed and the Federal Trade Commission partner together on a macro level to do some of this in the same way that the FCC did with uh, the Department of Ed on Connect, what ultimately is now Connect Ed. That's been an enormous partnership. So uh, next question. Uh, Joel Reidenberg, who you guys know is the person who did the study. Yep. I know Joel. Uh, jo okay, so uh, Joel, fire away. I, I'm gonna. I was gonna ask something different about modernization of of FERPA, since it's a 40 year old statute, and one of the things that we see is it just doesn't apply to many vast amounts of information. Uh, but I want to pick up on this last point and wonder if this might be an opportunity for the two, for Department of Ed and the FTC, to uh, 
collaborate and push forward. Um, if the Department of Education were to start elaborating, I know we're anxiously awaiting the, uh, the FAQs and the, and the guidance, but if the Department of Education is, to, just, yeah. is, is to, he's doing a great job, <laughs> by the way, Kathleen. You should just bring her up. <laughs> you should just bring her up on stage. I think she left the building. Is that, is that something that can dovetail with the FTC? In other words, the Department of Education may be able to set out guidance that isn't mandatory in the sense right. that FERPA doesn't apply. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, if the Department of Education is making a statement as to what good practices are and fair practices mm -hmm. for the industry, is that a hook that the FTC can then use <laughs> under its unfair and deceptive practice jurisdiction to help push industry to comply with those standards? Well, Joel, okay, you know better than any, just about anybody <laughs> in this room <laughs> that when we write best practices, and we do it all the time, our 2012 privacy report was best practices, a lot of the uh, guidances we've done for apps uh, in terms of privacy have been best practices, but we strive to make clear that best practices, if you fail to live up to the best practices, it doesn't necessarily mean we're gonna go after you in terms of enforcement. And, 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 and I think, I think if, we, if, if we don't separate out best practices from, from the things that give rise to an enforcement action, um, we're, we're confusing things terribly. And uh, I, I think we need to keep enforcement bucketed in the, in the bucket that where it belongs, uh, which is an, a practice that actually is unfair or deceptive, as opposed to one that strives to be the best or, or close to the best. So we, we, we strive pretty hard to try to separate best practices from enforcement, enfor, enforceable activities or bad activities. What I'm getting at is if the Department of Education says this hey, is- Joe, you want, uh, uh, Dennis, will you give Joel the microphone? Just because this, uh, this is a, it's a worth a follow up and then we'll have a question over there. If the Department of Education is saying this is what needs to be happening in the industry, so I'm gonna distinguish that from a best practice as opposed to, Here's what we're really talking about. FERPA would mean, oh. if it were to apply, for example, uh, something like that. So it's not a best practice. It's more this is the, 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 the floor, the law. interpretation. Yeah. Well, we'll take, we'll, we will, like everyone else in the room, we are anxiously awaiting them, and we will be very happy to take a look at them. So um, on, on this one, this is where you know, the multiple layers, right? So enforcement you definitively can go after somebody who has been shown an infraction in the law. Guidance, um, people who are inclined to follow uh, will follow. Um, market signals matter a lot. So this thing about gathering up people who um, are gonna have the ability to decide whether or not you get into the store um, because you have the seal of approval that says that you're gonna be viable to more parents than not. Um, that is something that frankly, doesn't have to be regulated that might have much more impact than um, uh, developers having to read the fine print on what the law says. And so everyone, I guarantee you, if those marketplaces start to make a determination that there are certain standards that you have to hit in order to even be available, we'll figure out what those things are very quickly. Um, uh, so we, we have to have all the layers. All the layers. That's a really good discussion. So let's go to one more question. So Ed, we're, you know, we're going to have one more question, and then we're going to let Ed Markey come in and I'm good. say whatever Ed Markey wants to say, but it, which would probably be very smart. I'm so gonna, I'm going to channel a question uh, that, that I have, but also one. And who? Tell us who you are. Oh, Steve McCoskey from Microsoft, and um, a, a question I've heard from a lot of the parent groups and and even the school officials that I've talked to, particularly about um, COPPA, which is Y13, and my question is. You know, I, I've heard the, the justifications for that in the consumer space. We've talked all day about this notion of, you know, do we just bring the rules from the consumer space over or do we start a new in education? And the real question is, you know, shouldn't the 14 plus year old kids that are in school, because we have to send our kids to school, get the same protection? Is there a real justification for that difference? And, you know, what are some of the potential solutions to what some groups see as a gap of protection for those older students? That's a great question. Well, why don't I take that since it's yeah. a sort of a copper related one? Um, but please jump in at any time. Oh, sure. um, there's, a, there's a very quick answer and then there's a more complicated answer. The quick answer is it's 13 because that's what Congress said it is. You know, when, we, when Congress speaks, we listen. Um, 
That's the easy answer. I think uh, the tougher and more subtle, um, uh, I mean, it, it, is, it is an important question. I've heard it a lot before. I've heard it from my European counterparts who are also dealing with the data protection uh, regulation and revising their rules and trying to figure out what should the appropriate age levels be. And they ask very similar questions. Um, I think in this country what we have tried, I think the reason Congress set it at 13 when they, when they said it was because as kids get older, as they start to approach adulthood, we do want, first of all, they have more First Amendment rights. They should be able to access more information. We might want them to be able to access information without necessarily getting parental permission in certain important circumstances, again, as they get to be older. So those are the kinds of things that I think caused Congress at the time to say, OK, we'll, we'll, we'll do the best we can. We'll pick an age, because we want to pick some bright line test so industry has some guidance, some clear guidance, we'll pick an age, and then you know, we'll, we'll do the best we can going from there. I, and I think that those issues about older teens, 17, 18, 16, 17, 18, are very real. But with respect to 14 and 15 year olds, yes, I've, I've, I've heard what you, you know, what, what you have heard, I have heard the same thing. Um, I think the kinds of things that can address, again, those teen issues are some of the things that we've been talking about, an eraser button for kids, Maybe, maybe do not track kids, things like that, that I think might be able to provide more protections for teens that aren't quite as onerous as, a, as the COPPA rules. Because the COPPA rules are, are pretty strict. And I think we as a society want them to be strict because we do want a safe haven for kids under 13. Jim, last word. Uh, I, think, I think that all makes a ton of sense. The good news is FERPA doesn't have that. So, right, that's true. Um, so we've got kids covered while they're there, there at school. That's true. So we're going to, by the way, we're going to have, a, we're going to move very quickly to the next session and then we're going to have reception. I don't know if Jim and Julie can stick around, but this has been an awesome panel. And I just want to say personally, again, these are two of the most important people in the country who've done great stuff for our kids, all of our kids over the past five or 10 years. I am proud to even share the stage with both of you guys. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, before we move to our final speaker and then break for our reception, I've just been asked to let you all know uh, that our partners at Sunnylands would dearly like to have their name tags back. They are sadly <laughs> not yours to take home and keep, so if you wouldn't mind, please drop them off uh, on the table. Also, uh, while we're changing panels here, as Vice President of Communications of Common Sense Media, I would like to point out there's been much talk about seals of approval, and we are in no way affiliated with Good Housekeeping Magazine, so we're going to have to come up with a little something okay. else. We're buying Good Housekeeping Magazine. Okay, so... It's now. I mean, this is going from. I will mean. I mean this. This is going to go. It's pretty, pretty good succession here. We go from some of the people who've done the most for people, for young people in this country, in the past five to ten years. We started with Arnie Duncan. We actually have had a ton of people, and, and a lot of them are in the room. We had Arnie Duncan. We just had Jim Shelton and Julie Brill, and now we have a guy over here. You. Should, I thought you were going to wear the Giants hat, Ed. Anyway. Um, but now we're going to now we're going to hear from the person who probably has been the number one privacy advocate in the United States over the past 20 years. Um, and other, other than the joke I made about that he should have been wearing a giant hat, I don't think Ed Markey needs that much of an introduction to anybody who cares about kids, technology, privacy, the author of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act the author of much of the most important stuff that's been done both in the House and now moving to the Senate. For kids on these issues, Ed, thank you very much for joining us. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jim, for that very kind introduction to everyone here watching on the web or listening in at the NSA. Good afternoon. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for paying attention to this very important conference. Uh, and, uh, and to Sunny Lands, um, we know your badges have now extracted all private information about us. And so <laughs> we will have them all returned to you so that you can collate the information so they'll know who is here and what it is that they are talking about in this conference. So you're a pioneer, Jim, when it comes to protecting privacy and warning parents of the perils of the digital universe. And I also want to thank April Delaney, Joni Lupovitz, uh, Jillian Oberfield, and the rest of the Common Sense Media outstanding team for organizing this
fantastic event. Uh, and I know that there's been an all-star cast who has come here this afternoon, John Leibowitz and Julie Brill, but uh, Arnie Duncan and many others is just an incredible group of people that you have gathered uh, to uh, discuss this very important issue. Um, because the business of storing and sifting through the records of grade stu school students is growing even faster than the students themselves in grade school. And we just have to basically accept the fact that if a technology uh, can do something, that there are going to be people who say, let us do that. And so as a result, our job on an ongoing basis is to ensure that as a technology is introduced, as it expands in its capacity, that we animate those technologies with the human values which we have uh, basically inherited from our parents, our grandparents, going back time immemorial. Values do not change. Technologies do. And experts say, well, how can you catch up with those technologies? You can't do that. And of course, you have to. You have to build seat belts into cars. You have to build airbags into cars. You have to put safety caps on top of uh, medicine. Uh, you have to build in safety. You just can't say, oh my goodness, values can't catch up with technology, with new things that could endanger children. If we did that, what kind of world would we live in? What kind of conversations would we be having today about the type of civilization, corporate driven, that we live in? And so we, of course, have a responsibility to have this conversation. And of course, you can add these values to the technologies. It's not that hard. You cannot have the same companies saying, look what we can do with an algorithm. We can pick up massive amounts of information, beam it to Osaka and back in under a second and a half, uh, and provide you with this tremendous service. And then you say to them, could we build in some privacy? And they go, oh, do you know what you're asking? That's so far beyond our intellectual capacity uh, to be able to achieve. Huh? And so you look at them and you kind of laugh. I laugh at it. I mean, come on. What do you think we're supposed to believe here? You can make a profit on it. Huh? So there's an old rule that you know, it's hard for someone to understand something when they're paid not to understand it. And so here, people are paid not to understand privacy, not to understand security. They can understand everything else that gives you all the wonderful benefits of the technology. But when it comes to privacy, even privacy of children, privacy of children, they can't understand. They tell you how difficult that would be. That one thing is the most difficult thing of all that you're asking us to look at. It's like the auto industry used to say that about seat belts, remember? The Auto industry used to say that about airbags, remember? It would be too costly. People really don't want it. There's an option there if they really want it, but people really don't want it. Huh? Then as soon as, of course, there was an airbag on the driver's side, you know what happened? Companies started to advertise saying, we're the first company that offers an airbag on the passenger side as well. Want to know why? Because the spouse was going, how come you have an airbag and I don't have an airbag in case of an accident, right? So all of a sudden, these kind of things just keep building themselves into the system. And people start to appreciate how much safety for a family is an integral part of the marketing of a product, even though they start off saying, well, that's an additional cost. That's an additional price that the consumer or the society can't afford to build in. And that's the way it's been for time immemorial. Even when I was doing the Child Online Privacy Act or adding other privacy laws over time, all of a sudden, if the banking industry says, well, we can allow insurance companies and brokerages and banks and all of them to come together for the wonderful synergy, and then you say, well, can we add extra privacy protections? They go, oh, oh, do you know what you're asking? I mean, that's like beyond our capacity. Of course, we can have mega bank and brokerage insurance company, you know, that we're all managing from central headquarters in New York City. But if you ask them then, well, how about privacy? It's like you're talking about a derivative to, you know, one of those CEOs. You know, you know they don't understand the derivative. Uh, and they've, they've kind of sub, you know, tasked that down to some kid who's a quant 
uh, out of MIT with an 800s in his math books. And the only reason he got 800 is they don't give you out 900s. That's who they hire. And so then you say, hi, can you have the same kid build in a privacy code? Oh, that would just not be possible. Huh? And so that's kind of where we are in this whole area right now. It's the same kind of double talk. Uh, when you're talking about children, talking about students, talking about building in all of these uh, protections. So there are positive effects, no question about it. By collecting information about students' test results and learning abilities, teachers can find better ways to educate their students and tailor lessons to increase student achievement. With better data, there's a potential to increase test scores, improve teaching techniques, and better prepare our young scholars for a better future. But at the same time, there are perils from a privacy perspective because there is an inherent Dickensian quality in the digital world. It represents the best of wires and the worst of wires simultaneously. It can enable and ennoble or degrade and base depending upon the use to which you want to put this wonderful digital universe to. And it's that dual identity that we recognize at this conference. It is that we want to reap the benefits of the synergies that can be created in helping a student to maximize their God-given ability, but we also don't want that same child to be harmed by these very same technologies. Our job is to imbue these technologies with time-tested values of privacy, respect, fairness, and accessibility for all, regardless of race, income, or disability. And I believe that putting student-sensitive information in private hands raises a number of concerns about the privacy rights of parents and their kids, kids who may be as young as five years old. The information currently shared by schools extends far beyond just test scores, grades, and attendances. It can include sensitive data such as health, disability, even criminal and disciplinary information about the child. As a nation, we've already decided that children require extra protections. In 1999, we passed the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, a bill that I authored while in the House of Representatives. And why did I author it? Well, very simply. As the principal Democratic author of the Telecommunications Act of 1996, which unleashed the broadband revolution, before that act was signed in February of 1996, not one home in America had broadband. Can I say that again? Before the 1996 Telecommunications Act passed in February of 1996, as I stood there with President Clinton and Vice President Gore, not one home in America had broadband. But I knew what that bill was going to unleash because I had the MIT Media Lab telling me what would happen if we allowed telephone companies to get into cable and cable companies to get into telephone. It was going to unleash this Darwinian paranoia-inducing Adam Smith is smiling in his grave, capitalistic marketplace, which was going to lead to a rapid deployment of digital broadband across our whole country. And we did have a dot-com bubble by 2000. I'm not proud of that. What I am proud of is I can see eight or 10 of you right now looking at your iPads and iPhones as I speak. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> I'm very proud of that. that. You're not even looking at me, and I, and I appreciate that. And, and uh, I look forward to the day when no one ever looks up again. <laughs> the whole communication is just with a device. But in doing so, I made sure, I made sure that we, then we would take the effort to build values into this new technology. It cannot have been beyond the capacity of us to understand it if it took us to pass the bill, to unleash it. So both discussions have to go on simultaneously. It just can't be the extraction of the economic benefits without any regard whatsoever for the absolute necessity to ensure that it is imbued with our own values. So COPPA is the communications constitution for establishing children being safeguarded online. 
1999. And I have a whole number of acts like that to deal with satellite dish records. You will want to know what's illegal for that company to sell, what channels you were surfing at 2 a.m. in the morning, that that's illegal. And I have a whole bunch of laws that caught up with the technology just to make sure that privacy is not a product. And I had to keep adding those laws because obviously that would be valuable at a certain level to a company to know all these things. So I'd be able to sell that information to other people. So you cannot collect information about children without parental consent under COPPER. The law puts parents, not profit-seeking companies, in charge. And after being elected to the Senate, I reintroduced the Do Not Track Kids on a bipartisan and bicameral uh, basis uh, in the House and the Senate to improve COPPER. And the reason that we need an update of COPPA is that that was passed way back in 1999 in the BF era, in the before Facebook era. Huh? So as the technology continues to improve, so too do we have to continue to track. Not just do not track kids, but we have to track the companies who would be tracking the kids if we don't pass the laws. You know, how complicated is that? And how irresponsible it is of people to say, oh, you can't do it or you shouldn't do it. Because we should. Children have always been in a protected category. We don't let them drive. Huh? We have safety caps. We don't, give them, we don't let them buy cigarettes. We put special protections around children. There have always been a special audience under the Constitution of America and decision after decision. And so we just have to continue to make sure that we do that. It extends the protections to 13, 14, 15-year-olds and younger. Uh, so that we are realistic about who it is that we are trying to protect. And I introduced the bill with Mark Kirk, Republican from Illinois, uh, my friend, because it shouldn't be Democrat or Republican. And in the House, Joe Barton, and uh, introduced it with Bobby Rush from Chicago. Uh, Joe Barton and I formed the Privacy Caucus back in 1999, uh, and Joe Barton and I don't agree on many things but privacy is one of them. You know, it's where kind of the left and the right meet to isolate the pragmatic middle. <laughs> you know, go, wait a minute. Well, we can make money off of this, they say. Don't you understand? We're the pragmatic middle. We're, not, we're only radical in one sense, you know what I mean? And so, so with that, you have this uh, very funny dynamic politically because you know that we're right, but maybe too soon for some people to accept. Uh, but you know it's coming. You know that ultimately we're going to have that day, that scandal, that incredible intrusion into the privacy of all children that will completely and totally make it possible for us to say no to corporate America. It's not about big brother. It's really about big mother and big father having control over their own child's educational records. That's really what it's all about. Parents should have the power over their children's inf information regardless of whether their kids learn online or inside their classroom. Parents today need the tools to protect their children, not just from the dark corners of the World Wide Web, but also from the whole wide world of businesses that now acquire and analyze information about students. Parents, not private companies, should have the right to control personal information about their children. A child's educational record should not be a product to be bought and sold to the highest bidder. This is just common sense. And that's why last fall, I wrote to Secretary Duncan, raising a number of concerns about the dangers posed by the increasing amount of student data that is moving into private hands. The Education Department responded to my questions, and I will say that Secretary Duncan's presence earlier today, as well as, his, as the guidance from his department, is going to really send a signal that underscores the commitment that has to be made in order to protect the children of our country and their privacy. The education department is something that, in my opinion, ensures that all of the stakeholders are going to be heard as data analytics companies increasingly play a role in the educational area. And that's why I am planning to introduce legislation in the coming weeks that ensures we protect our students from information that is shared about them. My goal is to introduce that legislation on a bipartisan basis as well. My bill, my bill is guided by the following principles. Number one, student data should not be used for commercial purposes to market products to kids. The goal here is to help scholars make the grade 
not help companies make a sale. Number two, parents should have the right to access the personal, personal information about their children and amend that information if it is incorrect. That is held by private companies as they would if their data was held by the school itself. That should be the standard. As we have already heard today, parents are largely in the dark about who has access to their students' information. Just as the erroneous charge on a credit report shouldn't prevent someone from getting a loan, a false grade on a report card shouldn't prevent a young person from getting into the college of their choice. Three, there must be safeguards put in place to protect sensitive student data that is transferred to and then held by private companies. Earlier this year, we've learned breaches at Target and Neiman Marcus that have affected nearly one-fourth of America's population. It's one thing to talk about Target. It's another thing when the Target is the children of our country. Number four, private companies must delete the information that they no longer need to enhance educational quality for students. Permanent records shouldn't be held permanently by the companies, only by the students and their parents. We must ensure that children are protected by data analytics companies increasingly playing a role in the educational area. I believe the time to act is now before parents lose control of their children's personal information. We can all agree that children have the right to grow up and learn in a safe and secure environment where strangers can't track or target them. And we can all agree there is no more important priority than protecting our most precious resource, the children of the United States. They're 26% of the population, they're 100% of our future. And we have a responsibility to protect them, to allow them to grow up, to allow them to make mistakes, and to allow them to be in an environment that we were allowed to grow up in. And we can do that as long as we have our values accompany the new technologies. We need to build privacy in at the beginning, not wait until after breaches occur. But we need all of you to help us stand up to make clear that we must put the children first. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all for everything that you do.